VE Day 1945, Londonderry. U-boat fleet surrenders. Witnessing the capitulation. On 14th of May 1945, soon after the excitement of VE Day, everyone not on hospital duty was ordered to parade on the river bank. We were to watch the capitulated German submarine fleet sail into HMS Ferret, the Royal Naval Base at Lissahalli, for the crews to give up their ships. We Queen Alexandra nurses of the QARNNS, being much too ladylike, never had to drill. We were met by a chief petty officer who told us that we would all be brought to attention when the fleet sailed by, and could we please all try to put our feet together at the same time, at the word of command. Dress would be negative raincoats, as it was not raining for a change. My chief memories of that day were watching submarine after submarine pass by with no sign of any occupants, except on one craft. There, a lone man, who might have been a figurehead carved out of stone, stood wearing his white submariner's polar neck sweater, staring ahead with a perfect profile, his iron-grey hair swept back and head up proudly. The other memory, from the sublime to the ridiculous, was of one of our Irish colleagues, wittering on and on and on. What shall I do at all at all? I have not got my suit on. I never thought it would be negative raincoats. If I take off my coat, they will all see I have on my dress and the white apron still on, ad infinitum. However, I do not think that the sight of her added too much more to the defeated Germans' woes. More German U-boats arrived in subsequent days, so that the aerial photograph taken on the 12th of June 1945 shows a total of 52 German U-boats, nine 21 class, 1,600 tonnes, carrying 23 torpedoes, four 9 class, 500 tonnes, 39 7 class, 500 tonnes. Arrival of the German patient. When I returned to our hospital duty after tea that day, already a German sailor with suspected appendicitis was expected in my ward. This was at a time when fresh horrors were being discovered daily, along with reports of the conditions in the German and Japanese prisoner of war camps. Many of our patients were vociferous about what they would do or would like to do to the expected German patient. He was duly admitted and proved to be a very young man of 18, who was very nervous and frightened looking. I was sorry that I spoke no German, as he looked so alarmed when I had to give him his pre-op injection. I feared he might think I was taking revenge. Before I had to go off duty, I asked the other patients to be kind to him and not to harm him in any way, but I need not have worried. Next morning, this German patient was completely invisible, surrounded by all the up patients, his former enemies. They were clustered around him, that is, those who could not sit on his bed. He was covered with gifts of chocolate bars, cigarettes, magazines, soap, anything they had to give. The young lad's face was wreathed in smiles of happiness, with so many new friends around him. Unfortunately, it turned out that he had a form of TB, and not appendicitis, partly, no doubt, due to the poor nutrition so many young Germans had suffered. The German government's catchphrase, then, had been, guns before butter. I have always hoped he may have survived. That is an extract from Hemiot Memories, eyewitness accounts of life during World War II, 1939-1945, and that is from Volume 1.